Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the last study of this week. As we return to this document, as we look to see what we are able to glean from the words that are presented, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we might more be able to clearly understand what our Heavenly Father would present and what is being presented here. Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of being so dense of mind that we do not understand that which you are trying to present. We pray for enlightenment. We pray for guidance. We pray for direction. Help us so that as we open your word, that we might more clearly understand that which you would have us to understand and be guided so that we are able to rightly divide the word of truth. May your angels attend us, for we need your protection. May your spirit be with us, for we need your wisdom. Direct us now, those that are in this meeting today and those that will view this later. I pray a blessing upon all. so that we may more directly walk with you. For this, Father, we thank you, and for this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, <clears throat> we got to this part last week, or yesterday, excuse me, when we apply Miller's rule number one to Daniel 11, it can be seen that the chapter is divided into several blocks of texts, so to speak, with each block centering around the principal subject. Verse 1 gives us the starting point that Gabriel selects for his narrative to Daniel. Now, does Gabriel select this narrative? Well, I mean, that's that's just more idiomatic speaking. Obviously, God chooses it. If we, you know, since the the premise that has been given multiple times within these documents is that Daniel and Revelation are one book. Mm -hmm. should, we should be understanding that when it comes to prophecy, prophecy comes from the Father to the Son, to his angel, mm -hmm. to the prophet. <clears throat> so this starting point is not Gabriel's, it is that which is given to Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gabriel's communicating this information. Um, but, but that's just sort of how we say things. You know, we often say Daniel says this, or, you know, John says this, um, even though it's actually an angel speaking. Right. Fine. So, <clears throat> Yeah, because John John writes it down. Gabriel is obviously speaking here, but um, the the main thing here is that you know he has this rule which he doesn't actually even address. Yes, agreed. Right. So now he's going to because you know we went through part of this in in our discussion uh, that we have this um, transitional verse, right? We have the daily. Um, being taken out of the way to make room for the abomination of desolation, which is different than in chapter 8. Chapter 8, um, it's showing that it's the same power, right? That is, even when you deal with the little horn, um, you know, it's, it's pagan Rome and papal Rome. And, of course, pagan Rome is part of paganism. Right. And then you have uh, papal Rome uh, being put into place. And he addresses this here, especially later on. 
Um, but he has some weird ideas that I, he doesn't really explain. Um, he never really explains why the United States is spiritualism. He's, he's going to state it later more clearly. So, um, so here at the end of this, you know, so he talks about this and then he says, well, the next sta step is uh, to determine the true identity of the king of verse 36 and its relation to the new power of verse 31. Right. So that's where he's going to lead to on this. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that section clarity from paganism, which some of this stuff, it, it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, it's what we would understand, but he doesn't give really support for what he's saying. It doesn't, it doesn't, he's not using Miller's rules. He's, He's stating some things which which are clearly correct, but he doesn't show us how he gets to that. Now, was there anything else in this section that you needed to look at? Well, <clears throat> this is kind of where we left off yesterday. Well, yeah. we did read this. We did do this part. Okay. Right. So the next part, because we left off at the last uh, last paragraph of this section. So if you scroll okay. down. So <clears throat> next, scroll down more. The next step. That's where we ended last time. Okay. All right. So here, as he is trying to give another subject break, he segues to verse 31. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, this is not unlike what we have seen before in Daniel 8.13. Right. Well, they're similar in that there is two powers, the daily and the abomination of desolation. So how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Um, so. So, yeah, they're, they're addressing the, these two, which are part of the same. Uh, 25, 20 year period. Correct. But they are joined in both verses by this, this word and. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're connected. Correct. And, they, and here you can see, clearly see that, that, um, uh, in this verse, because the daily has to be taken away, the other verse in verse eight, um, you know, the daily is lifted up and exalted. So one is showing how there's a transition between these powers that show that the abomination or transgression of desolation is really a continuation, especially since the little horn is actually both pagan and papal Rome, right? So it's the same power that is two different uh, aspects, right, of this this period of time. And then, so, but here we see that the daily has to be removed in order for uh, the abomination of desolation or the transgression of desolation to be placed or given. So when he says here, something is removed in order to place something else, this is not an announcement of the removal of the fourth kingdom and the placement of the fifth. This is not just, but is also represents a major shift in the opening strategy of Satan. Now, the operating is, strategy. is there five uh, operating strategy of Satan? Is there five kingdoms? I have not seen five kingdoms. Right. There's four. Right. right. So we have four kingdoms of Bible prophecy. Now, we, we see that there is, um, you know, seven heads. 
which which people then try to say, well, there's seven successive kingdoms. But we, we see that there's actually only four. All of the other others are just a continuation of Rome. Right. So Rome in papal form, Rome uh, um, in a republican form under the United States. The United States has modeled its government after Rome. Right. Right. We, we, it's a Rome. It's a republic. And then the United Nations also has characteristics of Rome. Right. Right. So, you know, it's based, of course, you know, the United Nations uh, building in, in New York. Um, but also there's lots of symbolism that that's used. That's that's a continuation of Rome. And we, we also do sort of connect the uniting the United Nations with the the seat, the mingling of the seat of men that is trying to unite uh, that kingdom. Now, um, Kelly had brought up before that you know there's uh, some book I can't remember who wrote it about uh, you know this idea of uh, the new world order is not really a biblical idea. That's that's um, there's there's definitely a partial truth to that. That is um, when we look at at the enemy at the end of the world. The United Nations does unite with the United States and the papacy, right? We have a threefold union. But the UN on its own is just following the lead of the United States. It's not the one that's leading. Right. You know, so sometimes people look at, well, you know, the UN or the World Economic Forum or the globalists are the ones who are going to bring in the Sunday law. And reality is it's the United States that does, right? That's pretty clear from Bible prophecy. And and so sometimes we get our focus shift, shifted to worrying about what, you know, the WEF is doing as if that is the real threat. And, you know, as conservative Adventists, often we, we have a lot of sympathy with what um, is, you know, Trump, for instance. We would have sympathy with Trump. You know, he seems to be more reasonable. You know, um, there's all this crazy stuff that's happening. And yet the reality is it's not I'm not concerned about Trump per se, but the United States itself, it's not that it's going to be globalist that makes it a danger. It's going to be because it is Protestant, right? Okay. And it's going to be a reaction to globalism. So in a sense, we would see globalism submit to uh, or be conquered by the United States and the papacy in the Sunday law, right? In order to be part of that union that there's a change that happens in the secular world. And this is one of the things we struggle with. You know, how do you get a Sunday law, you know, a, a religious Sunday law in such a secular world? Well, the world can change pretty quickly. Right. I mean, it doesn't mean that everybody is going to be completely religious, but the law itself is going to be a religious law and be seen as uh, a direction towards religion, not just uh, environmentalism or, you know, the unions looking for a day off. And and that's one of the things that really bothers me, I guess, personally, is that when people try to look at the Sunday law as, well, all these other things are leading to the Sunday law that I don't think are. You know, I, I really don't think that, you know, talking about the environment has anything really to do with the Sunday law. I don't think that people are going to embrace the Sunday law for environmental reasons. It has to be for religious reasons that this Sunday law exists. Right. So anyway, that's going to relate to when, when he starts talking more about spiritualism being the United States. Um, Okay. Next, he makes this comment. The same, tra <clears throat> the same transition of power 
is seen in Daniel 12, 11. And from the time that the daily shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. This text gives us a corresponding prophetic time period that helps us to identify the abomination that maketh desolate. It is the time period of the 1,290 days, years, that tells us the length of time that this power rules. Daniel 12, 11 to 12, gives us the time span for the removal of paganism and the setting up of papalism. 508 to 538 AD, a time span of 30 years, leaving a remainder of 1,260 years, giving us the length in years of the papal rule, which brings us down to the year 1798. Now, it's a little bit awkward sometimes when people address this, because one is the verse says, from the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up. There should be 1,290 days. And some people think that that is literally a number of days between the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation. And some take it as a period of 1,260 years between those two events. So, right, because of how they read it. But most people actually just take it as a period of actual literal days. So they have a time in which the daily is going to be taken away, whatever they imagine that to be. Um, and then there's going to be 1290 days. But the Hebrew syntax doesn't really say that, right? You understand what I'm saying? Like it's not 1290 days between those two events. The daily being taken away in the abomination of desolation set up is one event or a period in which that occurs. So from the time that the daily is taken away, then there's 1290 days or years. Um, but so when he looks in his next paragraph and he starts talking about how it gives us these 30 years, he doesn't really show that, right? I mean, he's already knows about the 1260. Um, but if he had used the 2520 here, and, and I know he believes in the 2520, but I don't know if he, uh, where he stands on the prophetic mirror and these 30 years and its symbolism and how the 1260 of Daniel 12, verse 7 relates to the first uh, period pa paganism. He doesn't really explain any of that. And, you know, I think if he's writing to not at or, or to not people not in this movement, to Adventists. He really should have explained this better. But, you know, that's just me being a little picky about it. I mean, he's correct in what he's saying. Just it's not. He's not showing any of this, really. Well, and, and then he's going to get really confused in the next chapter because or the next paragraph, because that we went through in detail and show what the time of the end and the indignation is. So. So he's not really explaining how the time appointed is different from uh, the time of the end. He sort of seems to think they're the same thing. It's also interesting because with Daniel 12, 11, there shall be 1,290 days or yom, time mm -hmm. of heat, versus when we were looking at 2,300 Arab Boker, evening, morning. Yeah. So Daniel uses two different words for specific purposes. But I agree, because this little paragraph, this sentence that he gives, this also lines up with the many days of Daniel 11.33, the time of the end, and the time appointed of verse 35, Till the indignation be accomplished of verse 36 and at the time of the end of verse 40. The, the concepts here seem to point to different situations, but he's wanting to combine them all as one. 
Right. Yeah. So he he and he hasn't really done a study on Daniel chapter 11 before that because he says we don't need to worry about all the minutia. When in reality, we do need to pay attention to all the details. Right. Now, now why do you think he says that about minutia? Is is. I mean, because people bring that up to me often, you know, you're too detailed. Um, you know, it's too too complicated. It needs to be simpler. A child should be able to understand it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What is the context in which you think he's he's bringing that up? Is it because of positions that you've stated, or or things that he's seen that that I've stated, or is it some other context? Well, one of the problems, and I'm I'm facing this with multiple people is they want to be able to give a, a very exceedingly simple message. The question that I'm asked all the time, what does the book of Daniel have to do with the gospel? Mm -hmm. And they don't get, they don't grasp the concept that, the gospel details are just as much in Daniel as they are in Genesis, as they are in Revelation. Mm -hmm. Now, and of course, it's in the Bible, right? So, I mean, many times people are saying, well, it's not important, but it's in the Bible, right? right? And of course, they might argue that, well, the 2300 days is important to the 70 weeks in some some way. But, you know, we're, it's not it's not something we need to spend a lot of time on. Well, the, the problem here, and this is, this is my problem because it's an example of what we were speaking of at the very outset of this meeting. When he is decrying the minutia, mm -hmm. he is stating that Miller's rule number one is not valid. Because yeah. Because that very simply states all scripture is necessary and may be understood by diligent application and study. Yeah, and, and he, he lists rule number one is every word must have its proper bearing upon the subject presented. Correct. But he's, he's only quoting part of that rule. Correct. Right. But if, we're, if we take Miller's rules one and two together, the minutia that he cares little for, Father Miller found to be quite necessary. And yeah. he also made, made this point in rule number two that every word, even the minutia, must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. Right. Now, you cannot say... I believe in Miller's rules and then say the minutia is not important. Yeah. Now, of course, the word minutia has negative connotations to it. Right. If, if he had said details, which is really what minutia is. Right. Right. Um, uh, that would have most people, more people would say, well, of course, the details are important. Oh, but but please remember the old adage, the devil is in the details. We cannot afford the devil to be in this. Yeah. Now, often we say, well, minutia could be trivial details. Right. But that that's just more a common way of. Um of of just using that word right right so, so that's not the word really means um right means details right that's what minutia means um and and so we believe that every every little detail is is there for a reason correct right so so we yeah. I mean, I, I, but yeah, it's it's just often used in the sense of something unimportant. Like the details don't matter, you know, people will sometimes say. 
But I have, and even though I'm a big picture person, I've come to recognize the details do matter. I mean, it'd be pretty hard, you know, to write a paper in, you know, like a doctoral thesis or something. I mean, nowadays you could get away with it and you say, well, you know, you're wrong here or, you know, you're leaving out this information and this is really important. You can say, well, the details don't really matter. It's just the main idea that I want to get across. Um, those details kind of get in the way of uh, what I want to say. <laughs> right? Right. It, you understand what I'm saying? It is, you know, that would be not very good. So the details are really important. And we found as, as we go through these details, as we glean the fields, um, that there's very precious things that, that are hidden that, that can be found, um, especially on the individual level for us individually as we study, that can mean more to us than some of the bigger things that, that are seen because of their personal nature, because they've been found through diligent work, through hard study. So... So, yeah, so here the many days we take as being the 1260, the time in the end, 1798, the time appointed, 1844. When the indignation is accomplished, that's, of course, at the end of the indignation, so 1798 again, which is also the time in the end, right? So right. he hasn't he hasn't really figured this out. He's just to him, they're all part of the same thing. Um, so when he says this lines up with the many days, um, he's not even being really clear whether he's talking about the 30 years um, as being many days. I'm not. Uh, it's just kind of weird how he writes it. But, you know, he's not being precise and he's not he's not being clear. He's just kind of lumping things together. Um, so that, that would be the problem that I would have. Okay. When considering this in the overall scheme of the succession of kingdoms, as outlined in Daniel, this particular move from paganism to papalism is the key transition in the entire chapter of Daniel 11. This move on the part of Satan changes the nature of the persecuting power from the physical realm to the mental realm. No. Exactly. Um, so one is he makes this statement, doesn't... Now, we would say it would change it from literal to spiritual as far as a counterfeit. That is, paganism is a counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary. It's literal animal sacrifices. But you can't say it changes it to the mental realm when we get to papalism. Spiritual doesn't mean mental. It just means uh, more symbolic. Right? Pretty much agreed. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, as far as it, it's the key transition, I mean, I would think that's true because when we understand that Daniel 11 is about the prophetic mirror and the 2520, then we can see why it's the key transition, right? Because initially you're dealing with these pagan powers and you're dealing with uh, a more literal history. But once you move to the papacy, you're de dealing with a more symbolic history, right? And part of that has to do with, um, uh, you know, the nature of those, of those prophecies of what they're trying to illustrate, right? So if, it makes sense that a more literal explanation is being used for paganism, which is a counterfeit of the earthly, and a more symbolic representation is given um, for papalism, which is a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary. So, so the, I mean, there's if he had laid out clearly the two 1260s and shown this transition. And then the part that pagan Rome has to play, because that's one of the things we have is that 
504 years, that's uh, 2 times 252, and, and the 1260 is 5 times 252, making altogether 7 times 252. And going back from 34 AD to uh, Jacob blessing his 12 sons, you know, being right. the same time. You know, there's so many things that could be shown and illustrated in understanding uh, what happens in Daniel 11, verse 31, and 12, verse 11. And how that relates even to Daniel chapter 8 with the 2300 days, why they're mentioned in that context of uh, the daily and the transgression of desolation, why they're mentioned in that context of the kazon. But they're not the kazon. The 2300 days are the evenings and mornings. Now, now another question, because you brought this up. Um, so why is it that Daniel uses evenings, mornings for the 2300 days? But for uh, the 1290 and 1335, he uses yomim, he uses days instead of evening, morning. And one thing interesting, too, is that uh, the days there is plural, right, yomim, uh, but evening, morning is not pluralized. It's 2,300 evening, morning. It's not like uh, evenings and mornings. It's just Erev Boker. So why why does he do that? And and again, of course, it's God that does it, right? Dan, it's just in the book of Dan. So so why is that that uh, we have the twenty three hundred evening morning, but the twelve ninety and thirteen thirty five days? Does anybody know? I don't have an answer for that. Well, we should have an answer. Okay. Okay, so in Leviticus 26, uh, why is uh, the periods of 70 years uh, represented by the word Sheba? Sheba mean, meaning seven. Yes. Just seven, right? So it's gonna he's gonna prolong their punishment seven. Uh, so one thing we can say is it's it's not good uh, Hebrew, right? I shall pro prolong to punish you seven for your sins, right? Okay. Yeah, so it so one is it draws our attention to it that it is symbolic. Twenty three hundred evening morning does not make sense in Hebrew. No, it wouldn't. Right. Um, now, so um, now some people try to put it to the morning and evening sacrifice, right? But that's the morning and evening sacrifice, not the evening morning. Correct. Right. So, so it's in a different order. So that's why you know some people add, you know, they they say it well, you know, how long shall be. Uh, the daily sacrifice, right? So they're they're trying to interpret this as having to do with uh, the literal sanctuary. But if we deal with the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement is where it's clearly stated from that that it begins in the evening, right? Uh, that's in uh, let's see, I think it's in Leviticus twenty three, if I remember correctly. It could have been in the other section um so this this um uh in let me see if i got the right place yeah it's leviticus 23 32 which is a chiasm um, talking about the day of atonement, it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. Um, so one of the things starting here with the evening morning I, I, I connect it here with Leviticus 
And it's also interesting that it's it, they say at the ninth day of the month at even, right? So so that so they're showing that when the ninth day is ending at that evening till the beginning of uh, the next day, which would be the eleventh, right? So you got from even unto even. Anyway, any that's just a, a thought here that's um, you know I wanted to put in just relating back to these symbols. So we can see that in uh, Daniel 8, that we are meant to understand the 2300 days in a symbolic nature, that is, that they're representing years. So then why is in Daniel chapter uh, 12, why do they refer to then um, just the 1290 and the 1335 plainly as days? and not some other symbolic representation, like like in the word itself. You know, because you do have the time times and the dividing of time in 7 verse 25 and 12 verse 7. And then, you know, in, in Daniel 9, you have, um, you know, weeks, weeks of, of um, you know, 70 weeks, which people just say, well, that's 70 weeks of years. But really, it's weeks of days, right? I mean, it's not distinguishing days or years. So any good reason why in Daniel 12, they're going to just use the plain straight up days? Well, as you were saying, this gives a, a, a specific reference back to Daniel 12, 11, for us to understand that this is going to occur at the time of the end. Mm-hmm. Now, the rest of this, with the way he's written this part of the paragraph, this one thing is the dividing line that governs the application of the precedent that is usually set regarding the kings of the north and the south in verse 40. Up until the fifth kingdom of the papacy, the kings of the north and the south are determined by the literal geographic land that they occupy relative to Israel, but this transition now takes the king of the north and the south into the mental spiritual realm. We've we just stated there is no fifth kingdom. Right. This, this is not something that we're finding within the Bible. Yeah, and I wouldn't and, and I wouldn't put mental slash spiritual realm uh together. I mean obviously there's a connection spiritually with the mind. Right. But if you're going to just say mental, spiritual, you're saying that it doesn't deal with reality. Right. Which is not what spiritual means. Right. Right. It just it means really symbolic. Right. It's more it's more symbolic rather than literal, figurative and, and spiritual. Right. Like right. In the sense but he, he continues on that same path to say this is not to say spiritual as in allegorical or in type, or figurative, but spiritual as in religious versus secular. Which makes no sense again. Well, we don't see that example in the Bible anywhere, that spiritual just means religious versus secular. In this, in this case, in this final few words of this paragraph, he strips away the veneer to state the prophecy remains literal. So here again, he is attempting to justify Uriah Smith. Yeah, but yeah, this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. Not at all. It didn't make sense with Smith. It's not making sense here. Yeah, but you, so so Smith just tries to say, well, the whole thing's just literal. He's, right. There's no figurative aspect to it. It's just a literal prophecy. But he's going to try to argue, well, it is 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 spiritual or figurative or allegorical in some ways, but not in the way that it takes away the literalness of the prophecy itself, which just doesn't make any sense. Because um, the papacy... I mean, the papacy is a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary, right? It's, it's 
it's, you know, it, it doesn't have animal sacrifices. It tries to look more like, uh, you know, the Christian uh, plan of salvation than the pagan plan of salvation. They wouldn't consider themselves pagans. But yet it's really paganism, just dressed up, you know, to look Christian. Um, so then he's going to argue, though, that the prophecy itself remains literal. Well, I'm not even sure that he knows what literal means. Here again, the attempt is being made to justify Smith. Okay. And we're not here to justify Smith. Well, we're just trying to understand this. What, right. What he's, but it does give us an insight, sort of. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, we're trying to look at this primarily about our own thinking and how we relate to things. But it does give us an insight, at least for me personally, into just how confused our thinking can be. Correct. When we're involved in trying to maintain a position that's not true. And it's one of the basic things that, that, that I've come to understand is that when you have truth, things are clear. Doesn't mean that they're easy, right? Right. But when you have truth, there, there is no contradiction. And so if I have a contradiction, if something doesn't make sense, if I can't make sense out of it, I'm assuming that there's something wrong. Right. With my thinking. Okay. My understanding. Right. Now, some people, when when there's a contradiction, they, they have their own thinking and they make the Bible fit into their thinking. And so they're going to throw out a lot of Bible verses. They're going to say things are, are typos or they're going to ignore different scriptures. Right. But as we continue to look at all these details, we have found that these things come together in amazing precision right which which testifies of their truthfulness correct so i mean and that's why the details are important because the details i mean when you look at something that we did with uh, revelation chapter 9 and you know i looked at the detail of the 391 years and i found that it was you know 12 periods of of 391 months on our calendar, which, of course, is obvious, right? 391 years is 12 periods of 391 months. But 391 months is 11,900 days. Well, more specifically, 11,900 days and 1,190 minutes, right? So okay. it's very bizarre. But then when you compare it with a period of 144,000 days, the whole period, because 391 years is 142,810 uh, days. And the difference between 144,000 days is 1,190 days. And so you have this 11,9 in three different ways within that calculation. That's only seen by looking at the detail. Right. right? Precise detail. Good for me. Yeah. Good for yeah. So... So all the details are important. They actually help us. They help clarify things. Now, we know that there's problems with our thinking. So what most people do is they have a, well, we'll just say a, um, uh, a cartoon drawing of truth in their mind, right, of how they look at the world. We're, we we temp, temp, tend to put things in rather simplistic terms. So we have some basic ideas that we believe. They've never been examined. You know, they're just it's what we've been told, what we've always believed about things. Now we have to examine things. We have to examine our own thinking, our own understanding, our own experience. And we find things that don't fit. Right. So we just brush them off. Right. And, and we see people do this all the time. Evolutionists do it when it comes to. Uh, the evidence of the 
um, the geological records, right? They want to believe in, you know, there's all these missing links. Have they ever found a missing link anywhere? No. No, nowhere, right? There's no missing links. I mean, one is you would have to have a continuation of all these missing links, but they haven't found a single one. And things that they try to claim are missing links are completely unrelated. One is they don't exist in the geological layers in that way. But do they care about the details? No. No, because they already have a picture in their mind of what they believe. And it's just enough for them that there are some animals that look similar, even if they, they, they show up in the wrong order in, in their so-called geological layers and how they date them. Uh, they show up in the wrong order. It doesn't matter, right? The details uh, make, they just contradict what we think. So, you know, when we're applying Miller's rules, it is to correct us of error, not to try to prove us correct. Does that make sense? That is, here's another way of putting it. Every time we study God's word, we are to study God's word to be corrected, not to be vindicated. Do we agree with that? Yeah, probably should be a rule of thumb. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I can't think of a time that, you know, we in our studies here where we haven't found something new that uh, went against something that we had assumed before like we've been corrected again and again and again in our studies it hasn't been about vindicating our position on anything right we're not trying to study so that we can prove that we are right and other people are wrong w would we agree with that that that's how we've approached it the way i've seen it so far yeah, for the most part. Yeah, because we know we're wrong about all kinds of things. And how do we know that? Found out by studying. <laughs> we were wrong about a lot of stuff. I know I was. Yeah, so so we know that because we've experienced it. We we could see we've changed our minds before. And and it would be foolish to say, well, Today, I finally reached a perfection of understanding, and there's nothing that needs to be corrected. I'll never be wrong again about anything. Um, that would be a really foolish position to take based on upon our experience. So, so we and and every time I have a discussion with someone, somebody who, um, you know, brings up something, some kind of objection, and I go through and I study it. I mean, I'm studying so that I can I can understand more clearly the scriptures. Um, I'm having a discussion right now with somebody who's trying to say, well, how do the sins get into the sanctuary? And as I'm looking at it, there's all kinds of things I never noticed before, which is is really helpful for me in my understanding of of the sanctuary. So that continues to grow, and that is. Old ideas are corrected, like wrong ideas, and, and we see things in a clearer way, right? Okay. Anyway, Dwight, you want to go on with this next paragraph? Okay. In other words, the persecuting power is moving from the male aspect of military might as manifested in earthly kingdoms to that of the church as portrayed by a woman. It has not lost the civil, but now includes the moral. And this twofold combination is the very nature of the papacy itself. It is a marriage of paganism and Christianity, an amalgamation. And as such, it maintains. It's true, but not so true. It maintains two distinct personas, the civil and the moral. The same principle holds true concerning the identity of the king of the south and the king of the north as they correspondingly operate in two distinct realms, one in the civil and the other in the moral. Now, I don't know what, he, how, 
Do you know what he's saying there? So he's saying the king of the north is a moral power and the king of the south is a civil power? Other way around. Or the other way around. Yeah. So he's saying the king of the north is a civil power, the king of the south is a moral power. Right. At least that's the way I'm taking it. And yeah, I don't well, he's yeah, because he's not clearly stating. Um, but he puts civil and moral first. And then he says south and north, and then civil and moral. So I would take it if he's putting them in order, right? Civil would be the king of the north. Oh, right, right. Or the king of the south, pardon me. And the moral would be the king of the north, because that's the order he has them in. Right. But I don't agree with this. Well, I don't know if I understand it. Now, now he talks about the male and female. So he's saying, well, the mil male is the military might, or really the civil power, and the female is the religious. Now we know that uh, there is a two horn. The, the the little horn of Daniel chapter eight has a masculine characteristics that refer to pagan Rome, and uh, female characteristics refer to papal Rome. Right. Right. Or as uh, you distinguish the two. Um, now, to say that the papacy itself is just uh, religious or moral um, and that paganism isn't, I mean, they're both religious powers in a sense. So, I'm, you know, why they're, they're used in masculine and feminine, feminine is to distinguish that there's something that pagan Rome does, right? It's going to come and crucify Christ. Papacy doesn't do that. Um, I have no idea what he's trying to get at. Like, none of this really follows from anything that he's been saying. Right. And he doesn't, he doesn't follow up on it in any way, really. I mean, there's sort of... It's very confusing how he looks at paganism... And, and he'll say things like, like in the next paragraph, this point will become very clear as we progress in our study, which it doesn't. Right. Right. Especially, you know, when we read, we read through what he's writing here. Stating the same transition of power is seen in the description of paganism in Revelation 12, which then gives its power seat and great authority to papalism in chapter 13. Papalism, in turn, gives its power to another entity, that of apostate Protestantism, spiritualism, USA, making up the image of the beast. But this transfer of power from papalism to Protestantism is seen in Daniel 11.38, but in his estate. This point will become very clear as we progress in our study. Well, I'm I'm going to be blunt, but I'm going to try to be kind. This is as clear as mud. And he never really addresses it again. Right. Right. So, so he doesn't know. Um, so he addresses it. He, he talks about it. Right. And, it, but in his estate, he shall honor the God of forces, the God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold, silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. Now, I'm not sure what he means, what he understands by in his estate. Um, without, without the details, without, as he calls it, the minutia. Yeah. This, this is a, a, a total jumble. Yeah. And um, now we have... Uh, you know, in his estate, that is, uh, where's this here? Where is this? Okay, I'm just trying to find this here. What is this doing, this document? So, estate is uh, H3653. Um, where is this here? It's not working. Okay. 
Um, and that word's used in different places in Daniel. And it just means to stand, right? Right. It is a, a base, a pedestal, station. Um, and I'm going to get to my dictionary here. Just to make this here. Uh, office, right? And it's used in Daniel 11, 7. But out of the branch of his root shall one stand up in his estate which shall come with an army, Daniel 11, verse 20 to 21. And then shall stand up in his estate, a raiser of taxes, the glory of the kingdom, but within a few days shall he be destroyed. And in verse 21, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person, right? So somebody's just replacing someone else. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, right? So one is he's not even defining, well, whose estate is it? Right. Um, so, so he hasn't really explained it. Now, I, I think, you know, if he's meaning this correctly in his estate, it just means that papalism uh, replaces uh, paganism. But but he's saying that it's it's Protestantism replacing papalism. Right. Okay. That's isn't that what he's trying to say? He, the the way he's approaching this is he is trying to go pagan, papal, spiritualism, or Protestantism, right? And I think he's confusing the symbols. Yeah, and and he's taking verse thirty eight as applying to Protestantism, not to papalism. Right. So this is to me is papalism. Standing in the place of paganism. That's his estate that he has taken. That's the way that I would look at it. Now, um, but oh, if, if you're going to take it that way. But we actually had that this was Christ's place, right? So we, we had reinterpreted this verse. That is, we retranslated. But in his, that is, Christ's estate, shall he, the papacy, um, honor the God of strength, the, the God, God who all fathers knew not. What? The God of forces. Yeah, which we have is the word strength. So right. we cross out forces and put in strength. And that is because we reference this to other verses where it talks about the true God, the God of strength. So he's going to make, um, in, in the place of Christ's estate, he's going to honor a false God, right? Well, while making, while pretending to honor the God of forces or the God of strength. So the God of forces here is not um, some sort of pagan God, but actually the true God. Right. And so uh, and a God whom his fathers knew not, that is a counterfeit Christ, shall he honor with gold and silver, with precious stones, with pleasant strings. So that's famous. That's the idolatrous worship of the papacy uh, through his counterfeit Sabbath. That is Sunday. So we translated this. But as to the almighty God. So another way that we could look at this. But as to the almighty God, shall he honor in his place? Yea. He shall honor a God, a counterfeit Christ, whom his fathers knew not. Right. So that's how we eventually translated that verse. Right. OK, so in his estate, either either it would be um, the paganism's estate. Right. That he's going to put in his place. Papalism is replacing it. Now, when you look at how we have translated this, this is in some ways. um you know, when we look at the new view of the daily, the problem with that, as we've discussed before, is that the old view of the daily never took into account that Christ uh, was a minister in the heavenly sanctuary, right? That is, it didn't see clearly uh, paganism and papalism as these two counterfeits, right? They saw them as desolating powers, right? 
They're going to be scattered by paganism. They're going to be trampled down, trod underfoot, stamped upon by papalism. But they never saw them in their counterfeit aspects. Now, the new view of the daily muddies the water in that issue by trying to say that the daily is Christ's ministry. But it's it's not the daily can't be Christ's ministry. But it is true that papalism counterfeits Christ's ministry and puts a uh, a false god in the place of Christ. Right? We would all agree with that. Okay. So, so in some ways, there was a an idea that should have been seen in the new view of the daily, that is, if we had understood not so much the new view of the daily, but understood what the problem was and how it was to be resolved, that would only come about by understanding the 2520. If we had understood the 2520, the new view of the daily would never have occurred. Right. Agreed. And, and we would have had a reconciliation of the 2520 and the 2300 days and, and all these time prophecies to the idea that Christ is now our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary and the and that papalism is a counterfeit in that. It would have all fit together because that's basically what we've done in our study of Daniel chapter 11. That is, we've come to understand what it was that Daniel didn't understand, which the Millerites didn't understand, right? And even Adventism today doesn't understand. That is, we haven't put it all together. So, so we know that there is this counterfeit that is the papacy. It's counterfeiting what Christ wants to do. It's placing, it's, it's, giving a pretended honor to the true God, but instead it's putting a counterfeit God in place of God. And, and that's so clear when we go, when we went through this. Now, when he talks about the mental, there is a partial truth to that in the sense that we know that the sanctuary in heaven is connected to what happens in our minds, right? That is, What's going on in heaven is connected with what's happening on earth. Right. That is, you know, when we deal with something like we're in the antitypical day of atonement, what we understand is that there is a work that's symbolized by the day of atonement that is now Christ is doing in heaven, but it's connected with what's happening on earth. That is, without anything happening on earth, Christ can't be doing something in heaven. Like if there is no end time message, there's no Millerite message talking about you know, the hour of his judgment has come. There was no time prophecy, like, or people didn't notice the time prophecy. It never was fulfilled. Christ couldn't have fulfilled his role as our high priest. He can't just arbitrarily start something. It has to be connected with what's happening to his people on earth, right? That right. will be on earth as it is in heaven. So there's this connection between heaven and earth, which Christ gives. So, so obviously it couldn't have happened, Right. There had to be this generation that would proclaim this message. And, and that work that's being done is not just something being done in heaven. Christ is doing a work because once his character is perfectly reproduced in his people, then shall he come to claim them as his own. So that means that the work that he's doing in heaven has to do with his people being cleansed, having them have his character. Right, which is why this you know, we're, we're, we believe in what they uh, pejoratively refer to as uh, last generation theology. Right, we we believe in this final generation that Christ is going to complete this work. That's what Adventism is all about. You get rid of that, then you have merely a a play acting of Christ in heaven doing stuff that really has no connection to what's happening on earth. It's just arbitrary. Right. Right. And um, and and so and many people fall into that trap, even in criticizing Adventism. Right. Like this guy I'm having a discussion with. Well, how do the sins, you know, get on Christ? It's 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 sort of like, um, uh, you know, Wagner, when, you know, he just says, well, how can Christ still be sprinkling his blood in heaven? You know, wouldn't it be dry by now? Right. 
it, it's sort of missing the symbolic nature of these things and, and confusing what literal and symbolic means. That's part of the problem I have here is he doesn't seem to, to understand what literal means. I, I mean, I'm not sure what he, he means by literal. And I'm definitely not sure what he means by figurative or symbolic if things that are figurative and symbolic are still literal in that it's a literal prophecy. I mean, I'm not sure what he means by that because he's not he's not defining his terms very well. And he seems to be getting them mixed up. Okay, so so hopefully that 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 makes sense to people what what we're talking about here, if anybody has a comment on it. I'm troubled with where he says papalism in turn gives its power to another entity, that of apostate Protestantism. So right. now he's saying that the apostates are going to be global rulers instead of the papacy. Well, it uses yeah. apostate Protestants as his military forces to persecute us. Mm hmm. Well, definitely, and to call it apostate Protestantism, spiritualism, USA. I mean, Their spiritualism is rampant in many forms, and the papacy is the crowning spiritualistic power. Right. But we we say the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The dragon power is, if we're going to give a label, we would say spiritualism, right? In, in its more, uh, we'll say, pure form. Because papalism is is spiritualism that sort of, uh, you know, it's clothed in more Christian language, right? Where uh, the UN is, is actually atheistic, right? I mean, obviously, all of them have spiritualistic aspects to it. I mean, even within Protestantism, I mean, you have... Uh, uh, the charismatic move, movement, which is really a spiritualistic movement, right? Using hypnotism to make people speak in tongues and be slain in the spirit and crawl around like babies. Um, yeah, and then to some of their so-called services. Yeah, so to make it look like, well, that's somehow the work of God when it's actually, you know, um, you know, not uh, how God works at all, right? So, but then he's also saying that this is a uh, gives its power to another entity. Now, is that actually what happens? Does papalism give its power to the United States? The only way I can see that is impelling them to do its the papacy's will. That's the kind of power. It's Satan's power. Like, you do this or you'll be killed along with the pe other people we're planning to kill. Very coercive and very violent. Right. So, so the papacy receives a deadly wound. It's the United States that makes an image to the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and live, right? So in a sense, the United States gives its power to the papacy rather than the other way around. Yeah, it surrenders to the papacy. It becomes a slave of the papacy, a puppet yeah. of the papacy. But without, without the United States, the papacy would be dead, right? It is what I'm trying to say. Is that the way that the language is in Revelation 13, is that the United States, it, it actually causes the papacy to both, you know, speak and live, right? How does it, uh, let me see, what's the verse actually say? Image of the beast, it both, yeah, should both speak and live. Well, yeah, once you do away with your foundational constitution, which was inspired by God, what do you have left? <laughs> yeah, You're okay. So, definitely spiritually so dead. Um, okay, so I'm kind of mixing the verse up a little bit. So what it actually says. Brother Theodore. Just hang on. Uh, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth that had two horns like a lamb, spake as a dragon, and he exercised this all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. 
and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast, that they should be killed. So the idea is that he gives life to this image to the beast, right? And he causes it to both to, to speak as well, right? And also that those that don't worship the beast in his image to be killed. Now, he is exercising the power of the beast that's before him, right? So it is saying that he is exercising the power of the first beast. Right, the first beast being the beast of Revelation 13 of the papacy. So he's going to exercise the power of the papacy. But he's the one that causes right. the papacy to live. He gives life to the image of the beast. So it, it, I don't see it as a transfer of power from directly from papalism to the United States. No, just the contrary. Because yeah. the only power there is demonic. Yeah. Okay, you were going to say something, William? Yeah, um, it's a quote that I um, read last Sabbath to that other group, and I just got the the name. I'm going to I'm going to tell you paraphrase what it said. Catholicism will give will um, become Protestantism, and I can't I ain't got the I ain't got it with me right now. But if you look it up, if you look Catholicism. Cat, Catholicism and Protestantism up, you bring it to that. You're saying is the word becomes in there? I think so. If I am mistaken, it, it becomes Protestantism. And it, and the whole thing is uh, the whole quote, you can probably read the whole quote, but it, Well, it says papists may change from Catholicism to Protestantism. Protestantism is that? That's probably not it. No, uh, that that that's sort of on the line of it. But the other one is that Catholic. How you say it? Catholic Catholicism. Catholicism or capitalism? No, not capitalism. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I had it more. I got it more. In all the statements I see, she's just comparing uh, that, you know, um, that that the Protestants are accepting cap, cap, uh, Catholicism. Papists may change from Catholicism to Protestantism. Um, so I'm just seeing the same. There's only 18 quotes where you have those words together that they're going to unite. Um, I think you're misreading the quote. It might be an idea, Brother William. Find the quote. Let's address it Sunday morning and see what, what we're able to glean from it when we complete this particular document. Because I looked at all the statements where you have Catholicism and Protestantism together, and none of them say that. Okay, um, I look. I get it tomorrow. I get it this for Sunday. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. So, this this paragraph that Sister Angela was noting that has problems, I think, for all of us. This understanding of the transfer of power from paganism to papalism and then to the USA via apostate Protestantism brings its own distinct clarity to the seven kings of Revelation 17.10, allowing us to see the same succession of kingdoms outlined in Daniel 2. In this case, showing the removal of the fourth kingdom, pagan Rome, and the setting up of the fifth kingdom, papal Rome. Now, I'm having a problem, and here I, I would have to take a page from James White. 
Daniel 2, we have gold, silver, brass, iron. Yes, mm -hmm. we have iron with miry clay. It's still iron. Mm -hmm. We have lion. We have the bear. We have the multi-headed leopard. And we have this beast. Mm -hmm. Where's the fifth? I mean, in in America, if I'm if I'm facing a court action and I have to take the fifth, I know I'm speaking of the Fifth Amendment. But where is the fifth beast of what's being addressed here? Yeah, there is no fifth kingdom. The final kingdom is Rome. We're so, in the time of the Roman kingdom. Exactly. But it is it is it is um a uh, it's a manifestation of rome but in different form correct right. now revelation 17:10 and there are seven kings five are fallen and one is the one is and and the other is not yet come and when he cometh he must continue a short space So, the five kings that are fallen are Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, and papal Rome. The sixth king, the one in place at present, we know to be the United States of America, which is inclusive of the image of the beast, apostate Protestantism. The context of Daniel 1131 is dealing with the time period of the transition from pagal, pagan Rome to papal Rome from the fourth to the fifth kingdom. Here again, there is an attempt being made to support Smith, yet I'm also having to wonder if this is not a, a tacit reference to the influence of Leroy Froome. Right. Now, so... So the one thing here, I mean, this is a common view that's held within this movement, that the seven kings are the seven mountains, which are the seven heads. But we're taking the position that they're not. That right. is, the seven mountains are the seven hills of Rome, right, upon which the woman sitteth. That's talking about Rome. And there are seven kings. Right? Now, uh, for Uriah Smith, he he has these heads to be seven successive forms of Roman government, right? He doesn't place them as kingdoms. He claims that that's, that's a false idea. And in each of the beasts of 12, 13, and 17, he has the heads consistently being the forms of Roman government. Now, we found that we could accept the forms of Roman government in chapter 12, the great red dragon, in chapter 13, we actually have the heads rep being representative of these kingdoms, right? That is, even though we're saying that that uh, there's only four kingdoms, there still is seven heads. That is manifestations of how this kingdom of the uh, is is um, presented historically, right? Because because the beast of Revelation 13 is, is papal Rome. It's a composite beast. It's incorporating all of these other powers. And in a sense, it is in control of the United States. It's in control of the UN. So we have the seventh head being the UN. But these seven kings, we believe to be uh, the presidents of the United States, paralleling the, the first seven kings of Medo Persia. And we mark them as at the time of the end. So the seven kings, um, the fifth is going to be uh, Trump, right? The one that is, is Biden. The other that's not yet come is the seventh, which we say is a civil war president. And he continues for a short time. And then you're going to have the eighth, which is the beast of Revelation 13, the beast that was and is not and yet is, even he is the eighth. So it's not a president of the United States. That's the conclusions we came to, whether we're correct in that or not. 
but to here to apply them to these successive kingdoms in the way that we had in the past, I think is something that we just had inherited from people like, you know, Roy Allen Anderson and others that never was really examined within the movement. Correct. Right. And remember when, when I, we had studied this and uh, somehow Jeff Pippinger got a hold of gossip of what I was saying. He wrote those 391 words in five paragraphs and sent, and it ended up calling sent it to me. He still would never, ever tell me who wrote it. Right. He would never admit to who that Jeff wrote it. So I'm, I'm still assuming that Jeff wrote it because of the style of writing. Um, I'm not sure why he won't tell me, uh, which, which I'm not happy about. I, I think that that's, uh, I don't know. That to me is just like, uh, I, you know, it's kind of childish. <laughs> Let's put it yes, that way. I just Something said. Like me being childish. But, but it, but it is, right? Like it's not clear communication. Why wouldn't somebody just tell me who wrote it? Right. And, and, and continue not to, even when I, pretty sure it's Jeff that wrote it like I'm not sure why you know um but anyway that that whole issue when we we started to understand that there, that we couldn't just take the seven heads and have them all be the same and the seven horns all be the same because the beasts are not the same and you know you've got seven he, uh, heads with seven crowns in chapter 12 10 horns with 10 crowns in chapter 13 and no crowns on any of the horns or heads in chapter 17 and definitely they, they aren't the same beast. So whether we understand all of this correctly or not, whether there's something that we've missed, one thing we can say is we can't just simply accept this idea as it's being presented here. We know that there's problems with it because you, you have the woman riding this beast and obviously that beast can't be, one of the heads can't be the papacy itself. Right. So the idea that it's just the city of Rome, that the seven heads are seven mountains or hills upon which the woman sits, identifying it as Rome, it is the most logical. And it's actually the most common way in which it's understood uh, by Protestant commentators in the past. Right. So this idea that it's these successive kingdoms is a rather new idea. <clears throat> Okay, before we come to his conclusion, we have one paragraph to address, and our time is pretty much up. Yeah. This transition is confirmed in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 to 10. As an eyewitness of pagan Rome as the fourth kingdom, Paul informs the church that this power, pagan Rome, will yet be removed to make way for the mystery of iniquity. This mystery of iniquity is no less than papal Rome. See also Great Controversy 446.1, Great Controversy 356.1, Acts of the Apostles 265 to 266. So my challenge for us all for Sunday is going to be to read these three passages from the Spirit of Prophecy and Second Thessalonians 2, 3 to 10, so that we can be prepared to discuss this when we return to this study. Any other comments or questions at this point? Yeah, well, we'll definitely address this point here because I'm he's not quite clear what he's trying to do here. No, he's not. Hmm. He's not at all. I agree. And this is going to take a bit more a bit more discussion than what we have time for right now. Yeah, yeah. They quote they quote one of them one of them is um, H F. That's here to forever. Uh huh. You you H F F F I mean F H three. 49.4. I thank you, Duke. Sorry. Yeah, that's from here to forever. Yeah, I think so. Which page? 
349.4. That's one quote. The one I read the other on Sabbath is a different one. Okay. Well, yeah, find the one that you had before. Okay. We'll look at that on Sunday again. Okay. Okay. All right. Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've spent together today. We thank you for the time that we've spent in study this week. We now ask you, Father, for your guidance and your direction through this day. Help us to do the things that are most needed to be done to give glory to your name and glory to your character. Grant us strength. Please impart wisdom. Help us that we may keep our eyes more properly, purposely, permanently fixed upon you. For this, we thank you. And in this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.